monsters. They look like monsters to you? I don't talk about myself all that often. Not really. I'm a rather private person, not prone to airing my dirty laundry in public, as they say. As I like to put it, my private life is precisely that. Mine and private. Though, honestly, that's not among the more prominent motivations for deferring the subject, should it ever arise. I'd go so far as to say it even ranks as a tertiary element. I mind my business, but it's not like I'm particularly averse to making things personal. Several comments in my previous videos will bear that out. Truth be told, I just don't find myself to be an especially interesting subject of discussion. I've already lived through everything that I could tell you about myself, and I just don't see much reason in going over it a second time. Like watching a film, even if it's one that I'm especially fond of, if I've just watched it, I'm not likely to press play and immediately go through it a second time. So when people do ask me about my life, I typically reply with something broadly non-committal. Perhaps commenting on something mundane or broadly indicative of my recent activities. More commonly, I'll talk about something tangentially related. My daughter asked me for a new toy, I'm planning a trip with my wife, that kind of thing. Something that ties more into other people around me, you know what I mean? Then I'll move on and steer the conversation to something else that I just find to be more interesting. It seems to work out quite nicely for me because most people do tend to be more self-focused after all. Not that that's a bad thing, don't get me wrong. I'm extremely focused on my own life, I think, you know, it's my life and all. It tends to be amongst the most important things in, well, my life. Being selfish isn't selfish, does that make sense? I mean, think about it. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anything. Helping other people is great and all, but if you don't take care of yourself first and foremost, you can't take care of shit. Because you'll find yourself ending up a bit on the dead side. That's been known to put a bit of a damper on people's ability to do anything particularly noteworthy. Well, sorry. We thought you were dead. I was. I'm better now. There's an odd stigma associated with considering your own needs. Often, sadly, to such an extreme extent that many societies not only encourage, but outright praise self-sacrifice to such an absurd extent that even using words like I or me will lead to implicit ostracism. It tends to be presented in the guise of being a good person, helping those less fortunate. But let's be honest here, it's all politics. If you can encourage a person to put aside their sense of self-worth, they're easier to control and manipulate into serving the supposed elite. It's a worthy cause to neglect oneself in service of something greater. By being a part of the whole, we contribute to a superior society. By serving the greater good, we improve the lot for all. Right? Not just ourselves, we make a better world for everyone. Especially the children, those who come after us. We're doing it all for them. So they can live with privileges that we never could have dreamed of. Isn't that right? Let's just ignore the fact that they're only going to be subtly nudged into the same mindset, shall we? It's harder to see the bigger picture when you're mushed right up in the middle of it, after all. <clears throat> And that's just the way the ruling classes want it to be. That's what they've always wanted, and what they will infinitely encourage. But wait, that's not really a thing anymore. That only happens in films and exotic, mysterious foreign cultures without any agency of their own. That's not something we can really relate to here in the West, because we have so much freedom and liberty and... <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, enough of that. America, fuck yeah! Coming again to save the motherfucking day, yeah! America, fuck yeah! 
See, I'm doing it again. Wandering off on a tangent. Though at What's this it? point, one would hope that my train of thought, style of expression, has demonstrated its merits. All of this, as tangential and confusingly lateral as it may seem, does bear direct and intimately significant relevance to the subject at hand. O oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> Get used to this, by the way, because that's just the way my mind works. Context is important, and sometimes, most times, it takes a little, read, a lot, of long-winded expounding to bear fruit. See, I don't talk about myself all that much, and that has nothing to do with my views on social control. It's not about me being ashamed of who I am, or trying to obscure facets of myself to give my life an air of added significance that it doesn't possess. I genuinely just don't find interest in repeating information I'm already cognizant of. But that's not to say I obfuscate things either. There are quite a few tidbits about myself that are openly, readily available. My full postal address is listed in the about section of this channel because I genuinely have nothing to hide. And if someone really did want to find me, it's all about public records anyway. So just save people the hassle of digging through census data and let them go straight to the source. If you want to know, just ask. Anything that is private, I'll just say so. I'm not going to be offended in the asking. Curiosity should be encouraged, not derided. No harm, no foul, right? But okay, let's bring this back on track. Get to the point I've alluded to. I have anxiety issues, as many in the modern world do. Quite severe and debilitating. I've never hidden that. It's one of the few pieces of information I freely volunteer on a regular basis. Because it's immediately relevant to how I am and how I present as a person. Agoraphobia does not inform who I am but it does greatly influence how I interact with the world around me and the people that I meet. And a lot of that anxiety stems from my observation of the way the world works. Big brain me. Whoa. So what does this have to do with Silent Hill 4? Because it's been long enough of my rambling that you have to be at least a little bit confused by precisely how long I've spent going over this. I mean, you came here to hear a dissection of a psychological thriller, so what does social control and identity politics have to do with all that? Apart from everything, depending who you talk to, because it does seem to pop up absolutely fucking everywhere for any reason, because we all have to be told how terrible we are for not supporting X ideology. So I'm just jumping on the bandwagon. Internet journalist and all that. Or maybe go fuck yourself. I have no patience, none, for that kind of self-indulgent grandstanding. If your sole purpose in life is to shove your chosen ideology down everyone's throats, taking every opportunity you possibly can to start grandstanding about how everyone you disagree with is literally O oh, Satan bin Hitler, well, there's a time and a place, honestly. You know, go for it. And sometimes, often even, it can be extremely fruitful and directly relevant to the subject at hand, just without the preaching. There's never going to be a right time and place for that. It just isn't. Okay, my own preaching. Oh, the irony. Real big on irony around here. My own preaching aside, there's a valid case to be made for politics being relevant to Silent Hill 4. See, though we may often consider the phenomenon of Hikikomori to be a recent trend, it actually has its origins in the 1990s, with the early 2000s marking its progression to a recognized part of the Japanese cultural zeitgeist. And though I have not come across any mention of this, I find it highly unlikely that the themes explored in Silent Hill 4 were chosen in complete isolation from the growing concerns of the modern hermit. To that end, I'd like to go off on an even more lateral tangent for a few minutes. Except, well, I'm actually not going anywhere, philosophically speaking. 
I haven't been at this for long, this long form video treat shenanigitis. I mean, but I'm already selling out, just like the best of them, and bringing in outside influences. All in aid of that full YouTuber cred of being a shill for the liberal intelligentsia encroaching into our most sacred places from the inside, subtly swaying us to the gay agenda with an army of NPHs doing the unspeakable of making us like them by being decent people. How dare they? I'm gonna bend. <laughs> I right. <clears throat> anyway, I'm going to hand this over to a friend of mine for a few minutes. Uh, because one of the best things about the Silent Hill series is how intentionally unclear so much of it is. As valid as my own interpretation of the source material may be, there's rarely one clear-cut takeaway. And yet, there are certain truisms that just seem to coalesce out the ether. Sometimes it's all a matter of perspective, and it can be extremely beneficial to take a second opinion. So, take it away, Devin. Howdy folks, it's me, Devin, and I was given the microphone here to interject a bit, with permission, of course. So, I'd like to take the time to build on what Bob said here and add my own piece. But before I do that, I sh think I should state that I'm personally not agoraphobic, but I come from a place where I think it can look at Silent Hill 4, especially the titular room, with a sort of alternate but possibly similar perspective. I've spent a good 95% of my life growing up in apartments such as the ones you find in this game. Granted, they were nowhere near a small or dingy, but Room 304 is uncannily similar to the places that I spent, well, most of my life in. We have dull, small, white rooms with narrow, claustrophobic corridors that interconnect them all. And while homes feel lived in once their occupants add their belongings, there is something particular about apartments that make them feel more alienating than a regular house. Because no matter how long you live in them, they are still very much transitory, and are more akin to a big hotel room in which you can spend a few decades in before it's handed off to someone else. Beyond that, I'd like to mention that I have suffered with depression for years now, and while I've gone much better in the past couple of years, there are times when I find myself slipping back into old mindsets and habits. When I first started to sink into it back in my early high school days, I, I'd stay up for hours in my room, basically pacing back and forth in the dark to at least, well, keep my mind active while I fought to myself. and. The smallness of my room became all the more, you know, apparent, becoming immediately more familiar with my room and later the entire apartment that I was staying in, and I began to feel like I was sort of bound there. Of course, I was never physically stuck anywhere, especially when I was an adult, but I had become so accustomed to the environment that felt cold to me that I didn't seek out any change. While I felt trapped, I felt oddly comfortable in my position. I gave Silent Hill 4 a proper go when I was at a real low point, and oddly enough I felt connected to both Henry and his apartment. Despite Henry being seen as a sort of blank slate, I too was feeling very disconnected from others, and hell, I spent the better part of my sophomore year not speaking to anyone at school until I met a group of really nice people that became some close friends through high school. I had basically been cut off from people, and that, to put it lightly, uh, sucked ass. But it was the apartment that really caught my eye. The way you interacted with it and became more familiar with every nook and cranny, and the constant visits back with the endless pacing. So, when there was a change, no matter how acute, you became hyper aware of it. When I was heavily depressed, my room felt like it was in a sort of stasis, kind of forever stuck in one place with me in it, so any disturbance to that was, well, frankly shocking. You kind of just become accustomed to that odd, unbreakable stillness. Luckily for me, 
that stillness was breakable, and after seeking help, I'm in a much better state of mind than I was before, and I'm gayer than ever, uh, in both senses of the word. <laughs> the mental walls that had kept me down were mostly obliterated, and now they're just physical ones that hold up the roof to keep rain off me when I sleep. Not that there's much rain here in SoCal to begin with. However, when I go back to Silent Hill 4, every now and then, I see myself from a few years back, especially when I pace around room 304. Anyways, sorry for the rambling folks, I'll let our humble video producer get back to his video mostly undisturbed. Thank you. I'm gonna go off script for a minute there, because um, that's the second time I've listened to that now, and I expected something quite profound, because, you know, it's a smart kid, Devin. We've known each other quite a while now. We met through another YouTuber that we both have formed a friendship with, and I really don't know what else to say. I suppose I expected him to be quite personal, but not that personal, if you know what I mean. So, thank you. It's... I don't know what I don't know what else to say. Just thank you. That was very insightful and very raw in a very real sense. It was very real. I'm rambling now. So I suppose all I can say is again, thank you, and go check his stuff out. He's already doing better than I am, but seriously. He makes some really good content and I'm glad we met. <clears throat> right, well. Whether intentionally or otherwise, Silent Hill is the definitive artistic exploration of what it truly means to be agoraphobic. And I'm absolutely baffled that it hasn't been discussed through that lens in more detail. I actually check back from time to time, but the only noteworthy commentaries I can find regarding agoraphobia were a post on a conspiracy theory board that also talked about aliens living in the North Pole trying to mind control the world's population. And the other was a highly detailed university dissertation written by one fan of the game. There's literally nothing else I've been able to find in all this time. None. There's the Great Circumcision War of 2015 that still has intermittent rumblings to this day. Yeah, that's seriously a thing. That happened. It's, it's crazy. But the Silent Hill wiki doesn't even mention agoraphobia or social anxiety. Like, at all. Across all the games, apart from the side story Born from a Wish, that was included in later printings of the second game, Reagoraphobia, and Angela from the, the same game, Re being socially awkward. Perhaps it's because I am an agoraphobe myself? But I find it very difficult to believe that I'm the only one to make the connection. Even though everyone I mention it to seems surprised at the suggestion, even if, as typically happens, they can see my point. I understood that reference. On a surface level, I expect you're actually already nodding in agreement. I mean, a guy wakes up one day, literally chained inside his own home, unable to leave even if he wanted to. It's easy to see how that would be analogous to social anxiety. Psychologically enforced isolation. And that, on its own, there's enough to support my claim. But that is only a surface level impression. I acknowledge that. And if that's all there was, I wouldn't have given it much more thought either. But it goes far, far deeper than that. Without even leaving Henry's apartment, there's so much more for me to work with. But it doesn't stop there either. Oh no, not even close. But let's stay contained. Isolated, if you will, for now. It seems thematically appropriate within itself to do so. 
It's generally accepted that Henry has only three ways of interacting with the world outside of his apartment, discounting the hole in his bathroom that allows him to leave. There are actually five, two of which he can't really actively engage with, something else which already reinforces the sense of impossible loneliness Team Silent were overtly intending to impress upon the player. And even before we get into them, we need to look at Room 302's first-person perspective. It makes everything feel oppressively small, and all the more restricting because of how uncomfortably intimate it is. Where in most games, a first-person camera allows us to feel like we embody the grand hero, battling their way through insurmountable odds with apparent ease. Being trapped in a tiny apartment, separated out into even smaller rooms, already starts breeding a sense of unease. Like a trapped animal, pacing its cage without any way to express how it's feeling beyond impotent rage. That's what it feels like. It's easy to understand, empathise with, but it's very different to actually live through, let me tell you. Knowing what it feels like, and knowing what it feels like, there's a world of difference between the two. I sincerely hope nobody else ever has to live through the utter helpless hopelessness of being a prisoner inside their own mind. Because it extends beyond the physical. It's not the physicality of it that gets to you. It's the barriers inside that are the real kicker. That's what keeps you locked inside, physically and emotionally. <laughs> this is awkward. The thing that really starts to drive all this home is when you take a goosey through Henry's front door's peephole. Opting for clarity over immersion, the typical fisheye effect we'd expect is greatly toned down because there are things going on in the hall that we need to be aware of from a narrative perspective. We need a bit more clarity of vision. But this is offset by the odd smears of colour loosely circling around the outer rim of the lens. It can take a little while to realise, but once you do, cannot unsee. That's Henry's eyeball. Even before we've gotten into the most basic elements of the game's greater universe, even if it takes us a few times before we notice, it's already there in the periphery of our perception, subtly reinforcing how desperately trapped Henry feels, so hopelessly, impotently yearning for any external recognition that he's pressed so close to the door that his eye is almost touching the glass of the peephole, wide, unblinking, fixated on the thin curves of glass with such intensity, it's almost like he's trying to will himself through the wood into his neighbour's attention by sheer force of will alone. The unblinking part is more likely nothing more than a design choice. <clears throat> either not wanting to break the mood by having the screen sporadically flash black for a third of a second, or just not even thinking about it. I suspect the former though. I mean, after all, we don't need Henry to blink for us. We're quite capable of doing that ourselves. Which raises an interesting discussion around immersion, and how much is too much. But we'll come back to that another day, probably, maybe. That's not the only glass Henry can mush himself up against them. There are several windows across the back wall of his apartment and you can look out of them too. Tilting your head side to side and up and down, craning your neck to see as much as possible. You'll find yourself doing that, I guarantee it. Not just by moving the controller, but you actually trying to see more of the outside world. Very occasionally you'll see something relating to what's going on, or at least what's about to happen, but most of the time you'll just see people walking past on the street, cars stopping at the lights and taking turns, your opposite neighbours doing their own thing, you can even see two of them apparently engaged in a close relationship, moving back and forth between each other's apartments if you pay attention. It comes up later in vlogs as well, but we'll get into that some other time. Um, 
Some of the neighbours will look up towards your room, seem to stare directly at it, but just not see you, not even notice anything at all. Reinforced by one of the conversations you can overhear at the front door, your immediate neighbour, Eileen, asks the chap opposite if he can see anything, and he just broadly, casually shrugs everything off as being unremarkable. That alone is already uncomfortable enough. <clears throat> But then you hit the X button when you're at the window and you hear Henry starting to bang on the windows, shouting and hitting the glass hard enough that it shakes. Same with the front door, screaming for help, but nobody notices. Within the confines of the game's lore, it helps demonstrate the more supernatural aspects at play. After all, Henry's door is literally chained shut one day, from the inside, when he wakes up. Without him noticing, without any clear way for someone to have come in, set it up, then exited. And now he can't even break a few sheets of glass? Can't even be seen by people looking directly at him? That's disturbing. It's already disturbing enough on its own. But consider it from the perspective of someone who's lived through the emotional analogue of physical imprisonment. <clears throat> I've spent many an hour stood by my window, just looking outside at, at anything. Equal parts pining to be out there, whilst repulsed and pulling away because of a deeply rooted, fucking infuriating, irrational urge to curl up into a ball and pretend that nothing exists beyond the extremities of my own body. I've had panic attacks from hearing people talk outside my window from the other room. Don't even need to see them, just hearing voices. Get the palpitations going. <clears throat> it's okay. It's all in your head. There's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, no fucking shit, Sherlock. It's a phobia, you intellectual Morlock. Thanks so much for pointing out how childishly illogical I'm being. Not like I don't spend enough time in my own head pounding my own asshole about it. Wait till I get going. Where was I? Well, anyway. Take the wooden glass and look at them a little more laterally for a moment. Cast them aside as real, tangible, physical objects and back up a little further. Retreat, like I did, behind the walls of your own mind. Try to imagine the inner discussion going on between the rational, logical Western Hemisphere and the base, purely instinctual cerebellum. You see, agoraphobia, anxiety, and mental ill health in general is fundamentally linked to the brain and, more specifically, how different sections communicate with each other. We have this idea that specific parts of the brain do specific things, and there's some truth in that, but it's also grossly oversimplified. The brain is an organ. An organ. It's a singular organ. It's comprised of a multitude of little knobs and bumps and twaddles and switches. But it's a single piece of equipment with a multitude of functions. Kind of like a computer. Hence all the comparisons people keep making between them. But a computer has individual components that do actually do specific things with very little overlap. A GPU makes the graphics. RAM dictates how much your rig can do at once, things like that. And whilst you can have CPUs that will also output an image, it's not literally the CPU doing it. It has extra bells and whistles inside that do it at the same time. You follow my meaning? The brain, meanwhile, does do all of those things on its own, with the very real ability for different sections to step in and take over if the original component is unable for some reason often so efficiently that there's no degradation in ability whatsoever. That would be like a single stick of RAM being able to do everything a computer can do on its own without any extra diodes or chips or anything. Literally, a stick of RAM would be an entire computer. 
Obviously, it's not exactly like that, but the analogy will suffice for current purposes. <clears throat> for example, a deaf person doesn't need the parts of the brain that process sound, right? Since they can't hear anything, that part of the brain is now completely useless. You could just cut it out and they wouldn't even notice. And that's actually not far from the truth. The last part. But everything before that, well, those hearing centers will step up and continue to do the same job, actually. Processing incoming stimuli. But... It'll add those efforts to other parts of the body instead. It'll sort of spread out and deal with all the incoming stimuli. Since the deaf person can't hear, the brain reassigns those assets to bolster other senses as a sort of workaround. This is why we hear that a blind person can smell better than someone with all of their senses intact, for example. The actual nose isn't more or less skilled. It just has a bit more attention thrown its way. You see what I mean? The brain isn't nearly as straightforward as this lump controls how hard your wang gets. Even if that's what it actually does do. Um, there's a lot of back and forth and cross-referencing. Like a development team. <laughs> Good one. Um, they all have to work together, but they all have their own roles. But if Alan doesn't know he needs to add details, the wrong person can get the message. Or the wrong message could be interpreted because of some other distraction. Now could you send us three and sixpence? We really are going to a dance. <clears throat> My point is, when the brain starts getting muddled about what it's supposed to be doing, when it's not receiving stimuli it expects, or gets something it doesn't understand, or gets it in the wrong way, the way it's used to, odd things start to happen. Fear is an essential survival tool. A bush rustling at night probably is the wind, but it might be a tiger about to jump out and eat your face. Cats like to do that. I know these things. And if it is a tiger, it will run faster than you and almost certainly get you long before you have any chance of starting to sprint. Never mind anything else. They are the apex predator after all. They'll take a freaking elephant in a one-on-one -on -one fight if they're pissed enough. Seriously. The tiger will have an elephant. And it's not clear cut who's going to win, but the tiger does have an advantage despite the size difference and how thick elephant skin is. Have you seen one of those elephant guns? They can punch through a fucking tank. <clears throat> anyway. Um, but the fear response throws all those logical thoughts out of the window in the moment and tells you to bolt. Because you can worry about how stupid it is trying to outrun a tiger after you're not dead. Or be dead. Because it did get you. Either way, the logic of the moment doesn't matter anymore. Thing is, we don't live in caves and fields anymore. We live in firmly constructed housing of brick, steel and concrete. As we established earlier, even a tiger isn't nails enough to chew its way through a metal cage. Let alone a building wall. So it doesn't matter if the rustling bushes are a tiger, not anymore. You can just shut the door, make a cup of tea, and watch it trying to intimidate you to death through your bedroom window. Apex this, Tony. Sorry, I, I love tigers. Um, they're my favorite animal, like, ever. What was that about getting to the point? <clears throat> right, so take the window and doors and think about them symbolically. Bearing in mind everything I've just gone over, Literally pounding on a window is, of course, going to attract someone's attention, assuming you don't put your fist through it first, which would also be quite noticeable, shockingly enough. But if you think about it more from the internal perspective of someone with any form of mental ill health, anxiety in particular, it takes on a much more personal internal meaning. It's our internal needs and desires clamoring against the skull, desperate to get out and be recognized but unseen by all except the individual. You know, the whole idea of the hidden disability. No matter how insular a person may be, and believe me, I am an extremely reclusive person, there's still that fundamental need for human interaction. Human beings are highly social creatures. 
cooperation and interaction are the very basis of the species, the essential glue that has allowed us to create everything we have, including this game, society, science, and the mental and developmental disorders that have led to tacit rejection of the modern world that bred them in the first place. It's evolution in action. We don't move in small, tight-knit family units anymore, and the brain, as a whole, just isn't prepared for that. The logical side has brute-forced its way to a more effective living arrangement, whilst the base instincts have been slowly chipping away in the background. They're not gone. Conflict between the two is what causes a lot of the problems individuals and the world at large have been facing, both now, in the past, and continue to face in the future. <clears throat> Internal and external pressures have regulated some of it, but there are fundamental aspects of life itself that are still trying to carve out their own niche. See what I mean about politics actually being relevant? Of course, we all pretty much agree that cooperation and compassion are good things. Hmm? But there's a lot of grey area due to different worldviews upbringings, and the nature of individuality itself. There's no one-size-fits-all solution, not yet at least, but we're just in the early stages of the transitional phase between literally fighting to live and being able to just live. This is immensely significant to why agoraphobia, social anxiety, antisocial behavior and identity politics are such a fundamental part of so many lives. We don't know where we fit as a species anymore, and that translates into uncertainty around where we fit as individuals. Consensus will come, but it takes time. And the more people we have going along with the flow, the more difficult it becomes for those outliers to adjust. But because of the apparent pressure of being the odd one out, we try anyway. Try. And fail. Maybe overtly we seem to be doing okay, but it's all the stuff beneath the surface that's the real problem. That's what keeps us trapped inside our own mind and inside our own homes. It's such a bizarre duality. On the one hand, the isolation is stifling. The need to be part of the herd to flow along with the instinctive necessity to work with our fellow man for the security of shared success constantly at odds with the sense of not quite belonging. It makes the home both a prison but the one comforting constant. It's a form of cognitive dissonance. You want to change, you need to change, but that change is terrifying. So the home becomes a refuge as much as a prison. Which brings us to Henry's final recourse. Shortly into the game, he notices that a cabinet in his living room is slightly shifted from where it usually is. Pushing it aside, he finds a small hole that allows him to see into his direct neighbor's room, Eileen. Allowing him to, well, let's not be around the bush. Spy on the girl next door. Spy on Eileen. Something the game greatly encourages by making it quite clear that she's important to what's going on. <clears throat> so much so that we know she's in immediate danger even before we're overtly told to watch her. She seems to show genuine concern for Henry, not just the unusual situation, asking specifically after him and his well-being, inquiring with other residents if they know anything about him, what he does, that kind of thing. So when we crouch down and peer into her bedroom, we're checking up on her, watching over her to make sure she's okay. Right? That's all it is. A desire to keep her safe, and maybe vicariously experience a simpler, scant few moments of normality through her everyday actions. We're not spying on her. When she sits on the edge of the bed and shuffles her legs, we're not hoping for a glimpse of her skirt. We're just, academically, wondering if the developers actually put anything in there. It's not us that's the perverts, the devs. Team Silent, they made it that way, right? Don't tell me you weren't at least a little bit curious. <clears throat> and yes, they did put that in there specifically to elicit that very response. The hole in the wall, not the bit of this girl. 
actually don't know if they did, but the hole in the wall is definitely there deliberately to engender those, those very thoughts. Now that, dear friends, that is how you do immersion. But we will come back to that as a bigger discussion some other time. It doesn't just blur the lines between the game and the player, it overlaps them bluntly, explicitly, and deliberately to make the player really embody the mind of Henry Townsend. We'll cross the street. So that's it, right? That's all we have in the apartment. And it took us quite a while to get there. But there's still more to this. There are actually five things you can interact with. Five links to the world beyond the little room in South Ashfield Heights, as I mentioned earlier. But the last two are outside of Henry's control. And my word, if that doesn't just drive the point home even further. There's already an element of that with his three viewing portals. We can only observe, but we at least have the choice of when and if we wish to interact with them. And that's also partly true of the telephone beside the, his bed. But picking up the phone and dialing isn't something we just do at will. Well, I mean, you can, but... It's all you can do. You can make calls, but they don't go anywhere. There's still no interaction to be had. But it is also used at times to attract us to it. Some calls are incoming, further stripping away any sense of control we may be futilely still clinging to. We're at the whims of outside forces, don't kid yourself. So consider this a transition between the previous three and the final step on our internal journey. After each world visited, each new death in the 21 sacraments, Henry awakes to find his radio switched on, a news report adding a little more detail and confirming that what just happened actually happened. It turns itself on, then shuts down when it's ready. We have absolutely zero control over this. It does what it will, and we are a passive observer, just drifting along in the currents. So we have to ask, is it only the radio, or is everything like that? Are we really affecting, well, anything? Or is our involvement all part of the plan? Now, you can turn the radio on yourself and you can use it to spot, um, to give you a heads up of um, the hauntings later in the game. But it doesn't do anything other than make noise. You know, you can't tune it to a specific frequency or anything like that. You can't get a radio. So, you know, like a radio station. So these news reports are the only thing it does. And you have no control over that. Anyway, um, this has already gotten quite long. Um, uh, but there's still a lot more for me to talk about. However, as I said at the beginning, it seems highly appropriate that we keep it contained and we end here. For now, at least. Keeping it, you know, inside Henry's apartment. How apt, eh? I'm not going to make this a two-parter per se, but I probably will return in the future. I, I will return in the future to expand on what I've said here. You know, add more details. For now, however, I feel I've made my point quite firmly. I want to thank Devin for his contribution again. I'm sorry I rambled about that. I just didn't know what else to say. I was a bit taken aback by how personal you were. I, you're a damn good writer, kid. You keep going. You're very insightful. Um, but I wasn't expecting something quite so personal to me, if that makes sense. <clears throat> His content, as I said, is extremely insightful and his contribution actually informed a large chunk of the latter part of the script, so I strongly recommend that you mosey on over there if you haven't already. I'll put a link to him down below and all the usual. As for myself, I have a Patreon. If you feel so inclined as to support my future endeavours, do all the usual down below. Any support you offer will be appreciated genuinely. I'm doing this as a passion project, but that doesn't mean I don't want feedback, so... What? Not more to say, really, is there? <clears throat> so, brings us to the end. 
all I have to say now is until next time, when we will find ourselves skating along the reflective fringe, thank you for watching.